What's going on, um? What's going on, Mr. George? Another segment of that talk. Yeah. Mr. George, you're new to the crew, man. We got a new member, so you know what? Right now, we about to let you introduce yourself and tell us who you are and where you're from. All right. My name is George Davis. I am a na retired Navy vet, 28 years of active duty and reserve. I am the executive director of the Xena Project in Fort Bend County, okay. and I, I, I assist veterans, no matter where they are, with whatever I can help them with. You know, Mr. George, so you know what, before we even go further into our subject, man, tell us a little bit, of, a little bit more about your project. I want to hear more about that. I'm interested in hearing about that. The Xena Project is a, is a veterans. It's veterans, first responder, fire police, mental health organization, and it's centered in Fort Bend County, and for, well, actually Fort Bend and Missouri County. Okay. But the majority of the work is centered in Fort Bend County. Uh, we have a jail ministry there. We we did have an equine program, but now we partnered. We we we're supporting uh, the Warriors Refuge also has has one so we're part we're we're ref, referring to them sending people to them for their equine program and and also that's where we take people if we if people need housing we help to help vets homeless vets help or the vets coming out of jail you know as long as they're not on probation there's an instant room for them okay okay and I guess at a later time or whenever we can, if you like to now, if you have the information for people to get in contact with you, you can go ahead and tell them. So if somebody viewing this video see you, your face, and hear the, um, basically the subjects you're talking about, they can reach out to you. I mean, feel free to do that. Go ahead and, you know, let them know. And if not, we can do it at a later time, however you want to do that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my, my email address is tiger53 underscore nine nine at yahoo.com they can reach me anytime there okay and, that, and that's what we'll do we'll let them get that and again what i'll do is um in this video segment somewhere on youtube or wherever i post it i make sure i put that contact information so people can reach out to you and thank you for your service man i mean each one teach one vet to vet <laughs> vet to the community man still serving and i appreciate even you expressing and um telling us a little bit about what you do I just, I, you know, I, I try to do my part. Yes, sir. As, as little or as, you know, whatever it is, it's, I feel every little bit helps. Helping, and I help any organization. If somebody does the job better than we can, we take, we send people there. We take them there. Okay. We, don't, we don't, we don't try to do everything because you can't do everything you do it well. So anytime that, if we know that somebody needs help, we will send them to whoever does it best. And I love hearing what you say, because that leads into our next segment of just us talking about the VA and kind of helping people navigate through the VA, because the VA could be like a jungle, man, to where there's so many different areas and facets that comes with that to where sometimes we might have veterans who might have started trying to all receive benefits or go down to the VA thinking that, hey, if I go down here and I go out here and get this help from the VA, they're going to automatically pay me in. Then they find themselves not getting that help or whatever they may be seeking for. And then they become frustrated. And then they get to the point where they're like, you know what? The VA don't work. I'm done with the VA. I'm not talking to people about the VA. I'm not mentioning I'm a veteran. And then they go on help and and they get stuck in the system or in that wheel of veterans who don't get the help and the care that they really yeah. need. Well, the, v, the VA is like being stuck in the forest and not, you don't know, you don't know where you went in at and you don't know where you're going. Okay. And without a signpost or somebody to come rescue you, you're lost yeah. because if you've ever been lost in the woods, you, you'll pass the same place four or five times and don't realize how you got there at each time. Yeah. And the VA will do the same thing. They will they will tell you, call this person. And that person tells you to call somebody else. And they tell you, by the time you're done, you they'll tell you to call the person you started with. <laughs> Nobody's giving you an answer. Oh, yeah. And, and you call an 800 number and trying to get, a, trying to get somebody to pick up the phone. Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, because I've because I, I've met veterans um who like I remember I had this guy when I was living in Charleston, South Carolina. He was going to the VA receiving health care the whole time, but he never knew nothing about him receiving benefits. And the only way he found out about benefits was through me talking to him because I asked him the question. I was like, hey, Papa, um, so I hear you you tell, you explain to me the fact that you're going out there, you're getting chemo treatment, you're doing all this stuff, but are you being compensated? And he was like, compensated? What do you mean? I was like, you have all these different things that are actual, you know, um, scheduled ratings, but are you being paid for it? And he was like, no, I didn't know I can get paid. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't know you can get paid? You going down to the VA and you mean to tell me I'm going to see the fucking Nobody at the VA will tell you. <laughs> that is, they, they, they will not tell you that you can apply for a rating and get compensated. You, Nobody. You, you, I mean, just think about it. Every time you've been, nobody's ever told you that you have a you have a compensatable problem. No. Right. And You're Vietnam right. veterans, all any any problem a Vietnam veteran has is compensatable. Oh, I believe so. I believe so. It's yeah. not, anybody in, anybody that was on the water or at or on land in Vietnam, it has Agent Orange exposure, yeah. and, and it's a presumptive. And if you get any one of the disease, diseases that's presumptive with Agent Orange, you're automatically entitled to a rating. But the sad fact is, Mr. George, a lot of people don't. Or they, they don't know. So frustrated with the system. They don't even talk about the fact that they are even veterans. So the family don't even know to go help them. And that's one of the things I kind of want to, you know, get input from y'all about is say for instance, we have this vet and they close mouth, or we have a family member that know of a vet that, you know, actually going through a situation where they need help. What are they supposed to do? How do we help them? Yeah, and then that's it. If I, if a vet like somebody contacts me like that, one thing I like to do is talk to them. Okay. And and that is, and and not in a you know not an interrogation, but just then and let them tell me what's on their heart. Yeah. Because when that starts to happen, then you find out things about people that they don't tell anybody else. Yeah, I've, I've had that experience with Vietnam vets. I had that experience with a Pearl Harbor survivor. Wow. He told me about his experience in Pearl Harbor and seeing his best friend vaporized right beside him. Wow. But he, his family didn't know. And that's the one thing that I want to help do is bridge that gap because I believe a lot of times vets, we can be so stuck. And I and I get it. Some vets suffer so much trauma into it's like hard for them to place that trauma uh, to deal with it in the sense to where they be able, where they're able to talk to about it. For me, I'm fortunate because my wife served with me in Afghanistan. So I have somebody I, I feel more relatable to the way I can talk about it. Now I have you, Mr. George, and I always have Mr. Patrick, I have my father, because you know I have different people in my life that are actually military to where I was able to open up about it at first. Now, I'm willing to open it up with everybody because I believe if I open up and talk about it, I can get help or people know what's going on to where when certain things trigger me, they know, okay, that's Sindab dealing with this or he dealing with that. So we know he's going through a moment. Let us, you know, let him get through that moment or find a solution, you know, that can help him through that moment. And I believe that's why a lot of vets need to kind of talk about stuff because you'd be surprised of the help you can get. Because again, for me, I got out 90%. And the only reason why I was able to get the help that I had, I got was because I talked, I opened my mouth, I said something. And through me talking, mm -hmm. my uncle heard my problem. And he was like, okay, you know what? You need to call these people and stuff started, you know, rolling. Oh yeah. Uh, and what, what most vets run into a lot of times is if they go back home, mm -hmm. If you go back to where there's no military people there, then and you start talking about what happened in war, they they start backing away yeah. because just the thought of what you've seen is more than they can handle. I mean, it's more than what you can handle to to live through it, but they can't even listen to you relive it yeah. because it's it's too traumatic for them. Yeah.
And that's what happened to it. I mean, I find a lot of vets, their families really don't know what they've gone through because they can't, when they start to talk about it, it just, it, it disturbs people. Yeah. And so then they, they shut down and they, they only talk about it in a little small group. You know, if they have a buddy that they were stationed with or, or somebody like that, or somebody they, you know, had some, something in common with them in that, you know, they'll start talking about what units they were in. And the next thing you know, they, they're kind of, they drift off by themselves and then they're able to give each other comfort because they can, they know, you don't have to explain to them what the fire, what a firefight is, yeah. or, you know, <laughs> you know, guys coming out of Afghanistan, you don't have to explain why a goat running up to you is going to make you jump. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, there's no way to explain that to somebody who's, who, who has no, had never been in the military, ne never served in a war zone. No, you, you're right about that. Cause that's just like me driving down the highway day to day. My wife know that I hate being by cars because a lot of my time in Afghanistan, I spent 15 months over there, but because we, we were on a lot of convoys. The one thing I hate, I hate people trailing me and I hate people being beside me. So for me, I don't like being on the road for long. So I speed a lot of places. I'm learning to try to, you know, ease that up a little bit because I don't want to get tickets. But everywhere I go, I'm trying to get in and get out, and I don't want to be there for long. Even when it comes to stores or going to um, the actual, like, grocery stores or me going to a restaurant my family, like, my family already know because, you know, I communicated with them certain things. My wife know because, again, she was on, oh, I never told you, but she was on the other side of the comms because we were in the same unit. So she know a lot about what I, what I went through. So she's able to help me maneuver and, you know, go through the um the proper um, things I need to do just to, you know, help myself out so I'm not finding myself stressed out or, you know, feeling a certain way. And even with my son, even though he didn't serve, I got to the point where I talked to him and I told him a lot of things. Well, all my kids and they know, OK, well, hey, when we go here, let me look out for dad. Make sure dad is good. Hey, you good. And that's what I want a lot of vets to do is, man, sometimes I know it's hard. I know a lot of times we feel like, okay, well, I don't want to have to explain all that. But a lot of times in explaining all that, you start to learn yourself. Because for me, it's like the more I start talking about myself, I start to learn a lot about myself. Like, okay, this is what triggers me. And it helped me to start finding solutions to help myself out with what I was dealing with. Because when I kept it inside, it was hard for me to just process I guess what I was going through because I try to, you know, like most of us, we keep it inside, don't talk about it. So it's like you never get past it because you always, I guess, in a sense, live in that moment and can't wait till you find a battle buddy or someone to talk to because by the time you do that, it may be too late. Yeah. Well, and 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 everybody understands. I had a friend that I worked with at after I worked at an auction company, and he was he needed some extra money, so he went to work for Halliburton as a civilian over there okay and he was a, he he was a chef he they they hired him as a chef's supervisor for the kitchen okay and when he came back he, he went he went two trips over there and he says i don't know how y'all did it he said, what do you mean he says in two years he you never get a good night's sleep and then you never it's never quiet there's always noise yeah. it, there's a background noise and then when something happens you're you're immediately on the uh, on alert. Yeah. At the slightest change in the rhythm of the bass or the noise level, it 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 disturbs you. You can be yeah. sound asleep, and all of a sudden, uh, just a momentary silence will wake you up. Yeah. I know on ship, I work I work the night shift. I could sleep through anything except flight out stopping. Okay. I never knew when it started. But that 30 seconds of quiet when it ended, when all the airplanes were launched off, I would wake up. I remember hearing the burners of um those the on those those um airplanes flying off because even though I wasn't in the Navy or the Air Force, but being that I was in the Army, most of the place I was stationed at as an engineer, we were places where people were flying and flying out. So just that mm -hmm. noise alone used to bother me, but I didn't realize it at first because, again, a lot of stuff that I dealt with in Afghanistan, I kind of blanked out or blacked it out or 
you know, hit it in the back of my mind. And then it wouldn't be until I'm talking to a battle buddy or somebody who's down range with me. And they start talking about stuff. They're like, send that. Remember we got blown up on the side of a mountain? I'm like, huh? He was like, yeah, you don't remember such and such? I'm like, bro, I don't, oh, you know what? I do remember that story. And it's just like, it started bringing up things that, you know, sometimes you do bury and you try to forget about it. But I'm learning to accept the fact that I can't change my past. I just have to learn how to manage it and keep working past it because to try to forget it and blank it out or as what, you know, um, we did in Afghanistan because most people like how, like that guy, he was, he was saying he don't know how we dealt with that. Well, for us in Afghanistan, we used to self-medicate. Like over there, we used to pour all uh, Robotessin and um, we used to pour it in um, like a monster or rip it. And we would like find ways to create drugs from like Robotessin pills. Like, I mean, we would smoke hashish with the locals. I mean, we did a lot of different things to kind of self-medicate and to get us past that time. And a lot of it wasn't just the fact of what we were dealing with. A lot of it was just the fact that we are someplace away from everything in isolation with no communication. And you trying to figure out how do I deal with the fact that I know I have to be here for 15 for some people, 12, six months, like you trying to process, how do I deal with this time? Because a lot of that time, most people think every day we over there doing a lot. Not a lot of days, we have a lot of downtime that where you just going through the thought process of trying to rationalize and, you know, deal with this time in isolation like a person in prison. And that's why I believe a lot of times that we have to talk about stuff because the same way a person feels like, a person feel when they're incarcerated, I believe we feel that same way too. Because you're away from everything, and you're doing yeah. somewhere to find. I got that from I got that from people in the jail. It's just, it's really similar, and you have to find to find some way of filling in. Like on on ship, you were twelve on twelve off, okay. so you didn't, and and then you had a four section duty. You had your four hour watch in your time off, so <laughs> the, and that kept you busy because. Yeah don't can you imagine running around an aircraft carrier you would with 18 hours to you know run around like oh man now what do i do what do I, mm-hmm. uh-uh that's too much free time mm-hmm. you can get in enough trouble in just 12 hours oh yeah but when you give somebody another four hours of free time i mean there's only you can only stay in the gym so long you can only watch television so long what else are you going to get into? And you were saying a lot because you're making me think a lot about all my time in Gitmo. The same thing. I worked 12 hours on the block in the prison in Gitmo or the um, detention center or facilities. And after that, you know, with the Army, um, we still had to go do PT. Then we still had to, you know, do things with our soldiers. So by the time you look, it's like an 18-hour day. And you barely have time to sleep. And most of that time, you're supposed to be spending sleeping. If your family not with you, now you, you know what I'm saying, you're on Skype, because for me, for my um, 12 months in Cuba, or I would say my year and a half in Germany, most of that time, my family was on Skype. Like, I literally would have them put their Skype on, and we would leave it on day in and day out to where I don't even know how our computer survived just being online all that time, but that's how I lived and talked to them. But I can't say that was a bad thing, because then I think about non-vets who live in isolation where they weren't even able to communicate at all. So again, it just, that, yeah. yeah, that, that, that gave you an outlet so that you didn't, you did your mind didn't start to wonder when you were off, you had enough to keep you busy. That's the whole thing with all of the activities. It's not because they want to, you know, we, we want to just keep you busy. No, we want to keep you from getting bored because that's mm-hmm. when you really start to, that's yeah. when you look for, you know, some way to make to, to, relieve the boredom, something else to do, you know, sitting there thinking about my family, you know, and okay, some guys making, you know, got, got five pounds of sugar and some, and some corn and he's making hooch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and no. you know that it don't, it don't take long. No, no. And I mean, what you're saying, I know that to be true because that's what led me to, um, that's what led me to going into the psych ward because um, I spent a little bit of time in the psych ward for like a week or so when I was in Mannheim, Germany. And a lot of that was because I had so much time and I was away from my family too. At some point, it just like my mind broke. 
because I couldn't take being away from my family. And I tell people that's the only reason why I got out of the military because I wanted to do life in the military. But for me, living in total isolation, always being away from family because most of my time, as I never told you, um, I spent overseas. So I, I would say I probably spent the total of probably six to eight months in the States. The rest of my seven, eight years was overseas. So when you do all that time away from the people you know, the people you love, at some point, it's like my mind couldn't handle it. And when the Army tells me, oh, well, yeah, you and your wife do military, but y'all can't be together, it led to me just getting to the point where I was like, you know what, I can't handle this no more. And I just checked out, as most people would call it, and I just mentally couldn't deal with it. So, again, I sympathize with prisoners because I get it. When you locked up and you can find for a long time, mentally it starts messing with you, especially when every day, day in and day out, there are people you love that you can't reach out and touch. And it's just like the little things mean so much more to you when you can find. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand it. They think, oh, they, you know, they should, they in prison, they, they animals. But nah, they become animals because of oh. the conditions and the situation that they're in. No, we, and we, what we used to make them, try to make them feel special. We'd have a meeting and if we could, we just bring them coffee. I mean, you would be surprised at what they thought, you know, a, a couple of, couple of, a couple of quarts of hazelnut coffee that they didn't have to throw in the microwave. Oh, that wow. just, and having sugar and cream and, you know, mm -hmm. all of that, that was just, that was a treat. And if we got a chance, we brought it, we bring cookies and we wasn't supposed to bring any outside food in, but we were in a spot where they, you know, the, the, the person that was in charge of it lit kind of led us cause he was a vet. So he, he sympathized with them and we used it as team building. Yeah. So, you know, we had 20 something vets and their whole, everything in their lives started to change because, you know, that we had some that weren't going to change. They were just waiting to get out. But we had some that really started to affect their lives and make them think about this is better life on the outside than it is here. And then, and all I have to do is just kind of behave a little bit. Don't so have to be perfectly what? good. Just behave a little bit. So, you know what y'all making me think? So um, do y'all believe that the VA is doing enough to help veterans with all that or? or no, but the VA is only, the VA only does what the book says it can do. Okay. It, you know, you have to look at the bureaucracy that goes with it. If, see, you've never, have, you've never been around people on Medicaid that have lived in Section 8 housing or any of that, have you? No, I mean, I, I've been around them, but I don't know much about it, to be honest. Okay. Basically, the VA is basically, it's basically Medicaid for veterans. Okay. Okay. So it's underfunded. It is understaffed. And it has a bureaucracy that the employee comes first because the employee is vested in their job. See, they, they have this a government job, so the employee has a vested interest in their job, and you can't get rid of them. There's, you can't fire a person working at the VA if they have a brain at all. Because all you have to do is do your job. You have to, to stay employed, you have to do your job four months a year. One month each quarter, and you're safe. Wow. Because what happens is they got to give you warnings. They got to give you a, a verbal, two written warnings before they can fire you. And if you do your job for 30 days, any time in that period before they give you the, the last month, then then it's all wiped under the rug and they have to start all over again. But that's weird, Mr. George. And the reason why I say that, because I've heard stories of veterans. Like I was looking at this video yesterday of this one vet. He's in Philly. I don't remember his name. But something happened to where he, I guess something, something happened to where him and the VA weren't communicating on the same um, wavelength and he lost his benefits and now he's a homeless vet. And I'm like, okay, well, that's crazy because how can he just lose his benefits that easy? But yeah, you telling me a, a person who works at the VA 
go through a process of elimination before they eliminate it, but for a vet, all it takes is some paperwork. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's not it's not an easy process, but what they do is if they send you an appointment, say you need to come in for an evaluation for this appointment. Okay. If you don't go, then the evaluation says you're not you don't need our help because you didn't respond to us. Oh wow. So if you don't respond to us, then okay, we won't we just won't respond to you anymore. What, so is that for everybody or for select vets? Like, say, for instance, hypothetically, we have a vet that he's you, just MIA because he don't have a communication line. He still get cut mm-hmm. without them trying to find him? Uh, they're going to find him. Okay. They're going to find you. Okay. Now, if you have, if you're 100% disabled, uh, 100% non, you know, unemployable, they generally don't mess with those. Okay. But if you're if you're not a hundred percent and you're not a hundred percent unemployable, then depending on your rating, you get you get reevaluated every three or four years. Yeah. And if you don't go to that reevaluation, then you evaluated as okay. Wow. And if you want to get benefits back, then you got to start all over again. Mm-hmm. And because you and because you've been denied benefits. Now it now you're talking. It could take you another six years to get them back because there's no there's no penalty. Say if say I'm the person who's checking forms. They they do it by they do it at home. So it comes up on the screen, and I'm going through there, and I'm just tired today, and I don't really feel like I keep it open for a little while, and I say uh, I'm missing something. Put it back in the queue. Okay. Even though it might be in there and they say, oh, it's in there. Oh, okay. So it goes to somebody else next week or next month. Uh, but as far as me, hey, wasn't my fault. Yeah. And so there's no retribution on the person who who, who messes up. Wow. 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 And, and, that, and that brings me to my, you know, my next um question. So um, do you believe that the VA is fair when it comes to all veterans or does it feel like sometimes, because I know from my personal experience, they may, th- there are times when I feel like the VA is supposed to be there for all veterans, but it doesn't always help all veterans. Golf uh, all veterans have a preference right now. Okay. Now, Vietnam veterans, they're, 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 and if you're if you're a Vietnam era non combat veteran, you're at the end of the line. Wow. They you get you you get any kind of stuff after, you know, just whenever. There's no rush. And for me, that's crazy. And the reason why I say that because even though like for my time period, there are a lot of veterans who go to what we call war, but. I personally know of folks who are receiving full entitlement 100% benefits, but when we were deployed and down range, they didn't do nothing. And when I mean nothing, they didn't do nothing at all, but they're able to get it because of simple fact, they look at the fact that, okay, they were in Afghanistan. There's no way for us to prove what happened, what didn't happen. So they give them benefits, but in my book, there are a lot of folks that I, I, I mean, I'm not speaking on people's situation, but there's a lot of people that are being taken care of that shouldn't be in t- shouldn't be taken care of. And then there are other people who actually have legitimate needs, but they aren't being helped. And sometimes that's sad. That's sad, it, you know? It, that's very true. And, and a lot of times, people who weren't in combat have a, sometimes, you know, if they were, had a one of those type of jobs where they didn't actually do convoys, they didn't do patrols, but they were, they have, they, their whole thing can be based on one incident. Yeah. And, and as long as they have, as long as they can document that incident on paper and the vet is, is, is the reliable witness in the VA system, even though that they don't like to, to admit it, your memory is, is 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 as good as a piece of paper as long as you were there. 
Yeah, and I guess sometimes I could say that that could be true. But then, like, for my wife, for example, she, you know, was in the office. But there were times when we went through certain things where we got attacked, motor rounds came in, things, you know, um, like I would say mortars hit their building. They went through certain catastrophic events. But because um, they didn't apply for the cab badge, which, you know, that's a whole nother thing to wear in the rules and the regulation, you have to be like a certain amount of feet within, you know, receiving intimate contact and you automatically get a cab badge, which is a combat action badge. Well, she was within that vicinity, but because, you know, her um, higher ups didn't apply for it. Now, when, when she go to go apply for PTSD, she have nothing to kind of back her, even though, yes, yeah, she have a word and I can vouch and say, okay, yeah, she did go through this, but it's like she wasn't uh, yeah. even trying to receive uh -uh. PTSD. I'll tell you one that works. What she's got to do is she got to diagram it. She's okay. got to, the whole area, draw where the buildings were, where the people around her were, where she was, where the, if, if she had incoming, where the incoming hit. And, and all of, if she does that, then she can get it. Okay. Because there is, because I have a friend that does VA things. And, and one of the things he said was he had a guy come in, didn't really do combat, but a person got killed where he could see it. He diagrammed it. He drew where the buildings were, where the people were, where the guy that got killed, how far away he was from it. And he got full, he got 100% for PTSD. Wow. And see, that's something I didn't know. Even though, yes, I got it because of everything I went through in Afghanistan. I had my cab badge. I had my convoys and all the other stuff, but safe things, I didn't have that. I watched the detainee and Gitmo hang himself, and I and I had to help cut him down off the rope. So that would have been something that potentially, if I didn't get it that for that. Been wow. Yeah. Wow. And I guess, you know, what we're talking about, I, there, there may be a vet out there that have a case or a situation where they need to know that. Because I didn't know that. You just told me something new in this little five, ten minutes, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's what that's what I always try to do. I try to remember those kind of things, and I try to pass those on. Yeah, and that's and that's what I want to vet talk to be about us just having these conversations because there's a lot of misconceptions that a lot of veterans have, and because they might have known of somebody else or they may have had that one time experience. Like I've had brothers who, at one point when the VA wasn't as accepting of dealing with certain issues like Uncle Patrick, you know, he told me a lot about, oh, man, one time PTSD was not known. They used to call it on um, flashbacks or what, whatever the name was at that time they called it. They called it that, but for a long time, there were a lot of veterans that had a lot of different things going on and they didn't deal with it. So a lot of those people got so burned out to the point to where they stopped reaching out. They stopped going down there. And then now a lot of them want to go start stuff but then with the VA, they don't have no track record. And that's one of the things I try to tell a lot of vets, like, hey, if you got issues, go down there and see them. Like for me, I scheduled appointments for everything and I just kept going down there, going down there, going down there, building a track record because most veterans think, well, because I was in the military, because this happened, I'm gonna go down there and tell them and I'm gonna receive compensation without a track record. And then they find themselves getting frustrated again. <laughs> then they're like, no, yeah. I'm not going down there no more. And a lot of people, see, a lot of people, they, they have somebody that comes into their life that takes them by the arm and then says, okay. And, and they, it's, instead of, you know, the VA calling them, they, they, okay, this is his number now. You, when he needs to have an appointment, this is the email address you send it to. This is the number you call. Okay. And, and I'll make sure he, and then he gathers him up and takes him down there because they really, there's a whole bunch of them that just that they, they despise the VA so much and 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 the waiting because a lot of things that you time as a vet you don't like standing in lines anymore. Yeah, I mean you think about it, you don't like you don't like a car tailing you you don't like that be sitting on a place where you got 15 people standing around mm -hmm. you and then all within arms reach. Oh yeah, that and and if you're not on some kind of medication. That's gonna that'll that'll create anxiety in you. You you gotta leave. And I'm glad you said the medicine part because I believe that takes us into another segment. That's one of the things I wish a lot of veterans would understand and know. You don't always have to go down there and let them put you on all that medication. 
Because, man, that's another can of worms that we have to talk about. And I say that because when I first got out and I went down there to these students and told them about the stuff I went through, man, they had me on stuff, man, that it was like I, I was on some stuff for paranoid schizophrenia people. And they had me in my house to where, man, my wife would be gone. And I'm sitting in the house like, man, somebody about to kill me. So instead of taking that stuff, now I'm on these other drugs trying to deal with everything that's going on in my head. And I mean, it, it just got bad and it became a nightmare to the point to where now my only medication is I pray to the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer now. And I go to the gym, man. Like I found other outlets or other things to help me with that stuff because it's just like I refuse to take that medication. But I've also seen my brothers and sisters take that medication and I watch them go downhill. And a lot of times when I'm hearing these stories in the news that are reporting that veteran went crazy and they went and killed three, four people. First question I have in my mind as a vet, what medication were they taking? Yeah. yeah. That's what I need to know because instead, because I don't want to just hear that he killed somebody or she killed somebody. I want to know what were they taking? Because I know from my experience that medication ain't always good. It is not. The VA does not know how to pair. I, we, Patrick and I talked about that. The VA does not pare down medication because no doctor wants to say another doctor made a mistake by giving you a medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the, if he gives you the wrong medicine and it causes side effects, then the next doctor is going to give you something for the side effects. He's not going to tell you not to take the medicine that's giving you the problem. And he's not going to tell you which medicine is giving you the problem. He's just going to give you something for the side effects. Cool. So now instead of still, instead of saying, don't take one medicine, now you're taking three to, mm -hmm. to one, one for the, one for the problem you don't have and two to correct the problems that the medicine created. Wow. So mm -hmm. you can wind up, 13 to 17 medicines is not unusual for the VA. And it's crazy because I believe the medicine is the problem. The only reason I said that, Mr. George, I don't mean to cut you off, oh, yeah. but I'm saying that because, Mr. George, before yeah. I got the military, I didn't have all these issues. It wasn't until I went down, and I'm, and this is what I'm saying. I want people to understand. I'm not knocking the VA. I believe the VA is a great stepping stone, a great place to go to start your mm -hmm. process as far as life after the military. I, I, so I'm not going to just discredit them because they have a lot of great resources. But what I want to do and what I'm trying to get us to do is help people navigate through the system to where they don't mm -hmm. put themselves in certain situations thinking that this is going to benefit them. And they find mm -hmm. themselves way off course because most people have this mindset. Well, if I don't get the meds and take it, I can't get compensated. And I'm like, bro, that's not true because there's always different forms of things you can do to help yourself, it's just for everybody. And, I, and I'm not saying for some people may need it because they've been taking it so long, but I believe there's a group of people out there that may need to hear this. Hey, bro, if you assist, if you can, don't do that. Find another alternative. If you don't believe in the Lord, then th there's some alternative out there for you. But don't just stick to that, you know, that one-track mind the way you feel like medication is the only thing that can help you. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen more medication help some people, but the, the reason it helped them is they resisted medication until they got it down, pared down to, okay, you, you just won't blanketly take medicine, but this one will help with this and just try this one. Yeah. And then that and group therapy was all they needed. So they wound up with just one medicine and, and then with the group, the group, took care of every, all the rest of the, the issues. The medicine just made it so they could participate. That's very true because I've dealt with that. When I went into the VA, of course, I had a lot of my emotional issues. When I walk in, I was on 13 medications. And now I'm going through three heart attacks and I have cancer. But I kept telling them it was too many drugs. But then they will also put in my, put in my records, well, you know, you're an addict. I'm going, where did the drugs really come from? It started with you guys, with so many drugs. And what I did not know also, I think it was in 2003, we had some great doctors, but the VA had a major problem with some of their own staff on drugs. So what they ended up doing, got rid of the staff, brought in the schools, and now they just called medicating us, giving you 15 minute meetings with your psychiatrist, which sometimes now is a student, because they got rid of all the other people. Wow. And now just medicating us. 
And I'm like 13 medications and I'm having all these issues. But like you guys are saying, someone kept coming up, well, take his little intern. They said, they'll tell you in a minute, I am a doctor. They'll have a badge, but never had a badge turned around and tell you their name. They just know that you got the uniform on or something, but you're really working under the school. Like here in Houston, they really went Baylor College of Medicine. Yeah. But when you walk in, when you walk in the hospital, though, that's a doctor. They don't tell you who they're really coming out to school across the street from the VA hospitals. Uh -huh. We saw that happen when I was in Miami, Florida. When the VA went through so many issues, I think the CEO was fired a couple of times because the different presidents came in. Funding kept changing. And next thing we know, all we next to is just a school. And the medication just kept coming in. Now you, when you go, you used to have like 45 minutes at a great psychiatrist. But we had 45 minutes. With the last 15 minutes, they would do their notes. All of a sudden, it changed. It went down to 15 minutes. And now from here, you go get your medication. And just kept adding in the medication. And now to this, this what's this, uh, the opiate endemic they have it now, where a lot of these drugs came from? It came from doctors. Yeah. It started off with doctors. Yeah. And we didn't know how to navigate the systems and knowing that they were about the programs and the policies of different programs. We didn't know how to advocate for ourselves. Wow. So that I ended up in that situation. A lot of it, because even when I was given 100%, they still kept giving out drugs. They didn't say, well, at that point, we didn't have like the class of what you guys talking about the classes, uh, like anger management, uh, cl class for your relationships, class to deal with your emotional issues. I was in a great one that they gave me twice. And that was, uh, trying to think of the name of it. It is mindfulness. I went to a mindfulness class. I went to no drug class at any VA. I went to mindfulness classes, but you know what the VA put in my records? That I'm an addict, that, I'm a, that I am in remission from drugs, but they, oh, no wow. one ever said he never went to any drug class. We didn't test him for drugs, but we put drugs, that he's a drug addict because also you need to know, with the VA, again, I agree with you guys, the VA is a great program, but know that you need to go in and we walk in there, that you need to, just like in combat, you need to know how to navigate yourself through it. It's a great program, but definitely advocate for yourself. Yeah. Because at the at the point now, I got I'm an addict now, and where you get your funding from? So right now, I think for like like what we're doing today, things need to change. Yeah. I I believe a lot of employees within the VA and other organizations as well, and they want to see that change take place. It's just like what we're doing today. That's what makes it happen. Yeah. Peer support specialists, when I first came on board with the VA years ago, when we did not know how to go into the VA and ask our question, VA, peer support was, was created. Before they gave it a name, it was just a bunch of veterans on the outside, sitting outside, back then there were most people smoking. We didn't know what questions to ask the VA to walk in that door, because no one would tell you anything unless yeah. you ask the right question. So we started doing that. All of a sudden, years later, they came up with peer support specialists. Because those are people that are meant to, are are veterans that's gone through these systems with the program, and trying to navigate through it. You give them a lot of training, but also be advised. Some of these people are great at what they do, but do they apply no. it? No. You know, so you got to know who's going to really give you help and who's not. Who's there just for the job? Once I got this job as a peer support specialist or whatever job you may get, they're looking for another job. Yeah. No. He's looking for another job. He's not looking to keep helping you. So I love what you guys are talking about as far as how these systems work because you need to know how the systems work. Talk to people first before you start asking a lot of questions. Find out how does it work. Yeah. Information yeah. from people. And I believe that's beneficial. And I'm saying that because I know, like, for me, um, I always wanted to work in the VA. But one of my biggest problems is because of my PTSD, I have a hard time remembering certain things. So when they, so now it's like, at one time, it seemed like it was easy to become a peer support specialist and different things. But then as time progressed, now the criteria and the things you have to go through just to do it, it's like the list grew and grew, grew, like almost like um, how it was before I went into the military to after. Going to the military, you didn't need a resume. You didn't need all these things to get a job. Come out, 
they like, okay, yeah, we look at your resume, you have all these um, skills, but what about your um, civilian education? So it's like the VA kind of went along with that same trend. And a lot of times I know for me, that became discouraging because it's like, I really, 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 really want to do it. But the steps to doing it in the process, they made it so difficult to where it's like, sometimes it becomes discouraging. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Cause I'm like, okay, well, if they made it harder for me, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna find an alternative way to do it. And that's what we're doing now is I'm just trying to find an alternative way to uh, until I can get to that point to where at some point I break through and get in the VA system. Cause I mean, I done filled out like, oh man, probably 20, 30, 40 applications. But every time I'm getting denied, turned down. And I guess they want a certain type of person in there. You know, I get it. I respect it. But I still have faith and I still believe that at some point I'm going to get through. And if not, then, hey, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing now. I agree. The game of system again, all over again, that's one thing that I've noticed with a lot of systems. And they complain about systems, but they just, all they do is repeat it. That's yeah. all they do. They just repeat it because it's about the funding. If I create a system, I can get funding. But if I just try to do it and try to figure out as we go to, to have something created, that would be great. But that's not how it really works. Like stuff with politicians, it's a system. Who's voting for who now? Where does the money come from? And a lot of this stuff is built through systems. Who where's the funding coming from? No, and that's the same. And, and I agree with you because even with me wanting to start a business, when I go in there recently, when I told y'all I was working on this stuff, and I went down there to talk to them, on uh, which um is this group called Score. I'm talking to the lady. She was like, okay. She started running me through all these different machines, and I'm like, okay, I get what you're saying. And she was like, oh, are there other organizations that are doing what you're doing? I'm like, yeah, they are. But for me, the biggest fact that I look at it, they, a lot of them are not veteran-led. So how can a non-veteran help a veteran when they don't understand something? And that's not saying that there aren't people who aren't, you know, non-veterans that can't help us. But for me, I feel more comfortable if things are led by veterans because when a veteran see a veteran acting out of doing certain things, they know how to relate to them in a way that where they can help them, like um example, um for me when I was um working in um Mannheim, Germany, we had this female um that was in our prison, and she was down, she went down range like her first few months of um being in the military in the army, and she got blown up um in Af in Af Afghanistan, Iraq, and because of the trauma she suffered, um she lost the bottom of her feet mentally. She had a lot of different stuff going on. She was from Baltimore, of course, which that was another, you know, thing that caused trauma in her life. Um, the military was like her last hope. So when she went through a lot in there, it's like she snapped. And most of the people that um, she was dealing with, when she um, ended up getting incarcerated because at the time PTSD wasn't known. So the Army said, hey, that's a pattern of misconduct, which is another topic. Mm -hmm. Um, that we could talk about all day, but, you know, we're just going to keep going on. Um, she had that stuff going on. So instead of her getting the proper help, they incarcerate her. Now she's sitting in the prison. They feed her medication, but there was no system to help her out to deal with the PTSD related issues. So she just like had this thing to where if you didn't deploy, she didn't like dealing with you at all. Like she would just snap, snap, snap. Finally, I guess at some point she came back to our prison in Manhattan. I ended up meeting her. And when she saw that I was like her, me and her would sit there and talk for hours. And they're like, man, be careful with her. She can manipulate you, da, da, da. Like, they had all these different narratives. But for me, I could relate to her. And all I did was sit there and talk to her. And when I'm on the block, I mean, she would be sweet. She wouldn't give me problems. And I used to tell her, I'm like, man, I don't think you're crazy. I just think you misunderstood because people don't understand the fact that, man, you suffer trauma. And you need somebody who can help you cope with what you just been through because her mind is still trying to understand what did I just go through? Like I went into the military looking for a way out of where I'm from for her, Baltimore. And anybody who knows anything about Baltimore, man, that's a rough city to grow up in. So for this girl to go through all of that and then she looks for this to be her last line of defense or help and go through that trauma, of course she's going to, you know, lash out and do certain things, but you can't feed her, you know what I'm saying, more fuel just for her to be more riled up. You got to figure out, okay, how could I help her? And that's what I try to do my best to do is just talk to her. Because a lot of times, that's really what she was doing. She was screaming last night because all she wanted somebody to do 
would listen to her. And when I came on the block, of course she was on medication, but I used to tell her, I'm like, I don't think, you know, you're crazy, man. You just need help. But again, at that time, which was 2012, 2013, PTSD wasn't on the map yet. So a lot of people got kicked out, you know, during that time. When I was in the army, this is when the army was getting rid of like 20,000 soldiers. So any and everybody who they can find something on or find a reason not to want them no more, they were just shoveling them out the door. And, and that was part of why I snapped because when I'm going through all this stuff, I'm like, you know what, brother, sis, I, I can't do this no more. Because I mean, not only am I away from my family, but my brothers and sisters who fought down range with me are being locked up. And they got legitimate issues, but again, PTSD wasn't on the map. So the army said, hey, that's pattern of misconduct. Or, you know, whatever else they found the AR 670 you know, 1, you know, to get them out of the military. And the army was really, they were, they were really proficient, proficient at, at discharging people for questionable things. And, and, and they were, and they would deny reenlistments for nothing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I knew a guy that was, he was trying to, to go through all three, all four branches. And that he went through the Marine Corps, Navy, and he went through the army, and because he wouldn't reenlist, they gave him an RE4. What's that? It's a you can't reenlist when an RE4 is a recommended for not recommended for reenlistment. Oh, wow. I mean, not just, and that's for anything. That's that's must that to, sound almost like what they did with me when I um because my ETS date and my D Rose date were two different dates. My first sergeant, which at the time he didn't tell me, he um asked me to sign a deck statement. And basically what the deck statement did, which is what I didn't know, after I guess four or five years, you were entitled to a severance pay. And because I signed that deck statement, I waived my rights to getting that 30, 35 or 50 some thousand dollars that I was supposed to get after six years. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to receive that because somebody didn't tell me, hey, don't sign that paperwork, just do your time. But they were so ready to get rid of me. He didn't tell me that. So I, I get stuff like that happen, but that don't mean you stop fighting. That's the one thing I want vets to take from a lot of stuff we talking about, man. Don't stop fighting just because something didn't work out in your favor, man. There's always something else that'll work for you. You just got to keep pushing and keep trying, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it just, you know, he was, took him, I think, three, four years before he could to get that removed because he had to go, you have to go through a board, army board, oh, wow. everything. It has to go to DC. To get that removed. Wow. Don't find yourself desperate or when you get caught up in a situation trying to get your benefits, then all of a sudden you, you're so frustrated because it takes so long. Then all of a sudden someone gives you some form to sign, don't sign it, find out what it is because as I get, I got 100%. And also they just didn't offer it to me. I had to prove what took place. And they said, well, okay, we're not gonna talk about it. Here's 100%. But what they had me to sign was this form that form where, where it all started was when I was in the military. So I could have got all that time paid for. When you sign that form, you, you format that. You don't get that, you don't get that. You don't give you like four months, that's it. They go no back pay, no nothing. And that's what all initiated from. But once you sign the form, you don't know what you're signing. They're smiling at you and saying, well, we are working on your benefits to make it come through. Find out what you're signing. Because they, they don't tell you what you're signing. Like, they don't explain it to you. They give you an idea, sign this form. And you so, do the VA, so the question yeah. I have, do the VA have people that helps you with that stuff? They do, but the people that's going to ask you to sign it, they're not going to always help you. Remember, that's also a job. There's, there, there's more than one. You have the main office. You have the, you have the district office over there where they help you with stuff. But if you're in the hospital, you're that's on good. your own in the hospital. Oh, and that's wow. generally where they ask you to sign stuff. They don't send you over to the office. They don't send you over there where the people are get paid to help you. Okay. Sure. Ah, well, I, well, I'm glad y'all saying this stuff because this is a lot of stuff. I believe, man, it's, it, it, it could just be that one vet out there that need to hear this. And I mean, man, because I mean, just listen to some of the stuff y'all saying, like, I didn't know that. Would, I mean, even though, yes, I'm 100% now, but I didn't know that they were people that you can talk to. Because a lot of people, when I talk to them, I tell them, I said, man, when I got out, 
a lot of things for me, I didn't have to fight for because I was already fighting before I got out of the military, not for benefits, but I was already fighting for myself, my family, and my life after the military because after, like I said, all that stuff I told y'all about, I was just ready to get out. Like, I had no game plan. I had no knowledge of the VA, what I need to do. Only little bit that I had was, again, a veteran. My dad, he was like, hey, son, you need to go send this paperwork to the VA for this, that, and the third. But it was so much stuff in my records that I didn't even know I could file for or fight for it. Because, again, nobody was sitting down with me at the time when I got out in 2013. I mean, I know now they have a process to where people are getting that VA help before they get out. But when I got out in 13, there was nobody to sit down with you, even with the resume stuff. Like, I got out with this bootleg resume, and Josh laughed at me like, who did that resume? That's trash. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they, when, when I got off active duty, it was like, bye. Have a good time. Don't get in any trouble. Like, they didn't tell you anything. And that's no, one of the misconceptions that I'm trying to get rid of is people thinking that as veterans, we are just giving stuff. Cause that's the misconception I hear all the time. People walk into, oh man, you shouldn't have that. I'm like, brother and sister, you really don't understand. And I'm not again saying that the VA is a bad system, but because from just listening to some of the things y'all explaining, they're not permitted, they're not, they, they don't have to tell you. That's the biggest problem that a lot of veterans are faced with. Like I told Uncle Patch early in our conversation, I remember I was in the um, mental health and I found out that they had programs that where you can go um, you can go surfing, you can get your captain license, all this different stuff, <laughs> but they didn't tell you about it. The only reason I found out about it because my doctor saw I was going through a lot of different stuff. So she goes in her drawer, pull out all these brochures and flies like, hey, what do you want to go do? I'm looking like, okay, well, dang, I didn't know all this stuff exists. And I'm thinking in my mind to myself, like, okay, well, if y'all offering this to me, why aren't y'all offering this stuff to the vets? Y'all got all these brochures when I'm going all throughout the hallway with all this <laughs> information, but none of it is leading vets to sources and things that can truly help them. And a lot of vets assume that the only thing I'm coming down here for appointment, that's the only thing I'm going to get help with when there's so much help in the VA. It's just, you got to open up your mouth and ask questions. Well, you got to ask the right person. Okay. That is the biggest thing to VA. It's not just asking questions, but you have to get to that right person. And you have to ask the question the right way. Okay. Yes. So many times, one of the problems with PTSD is your questions get lost. The, you, what you really want to know gets lost in everything you said so that you can get it out in your brain, you understand it, but nobody else does. Oh, wow. So, you yes, as you guys know, I suffer from what's called aphasia. And that's, uh, I had a stroke. So it affects my cognitive, certain cognitive abilities to get my words out. Then when I came to Houston, I'm driving a convertible that talks to me. But when I try to get out of the car to go to McDonald's and place an order, I can't get the words out. I see it, but I'm frustrated because I, it will not, because, because I, I have a disability. But okay. people don't notice all, always our disabilities. All disabilities are not always seen. Okay. You know, so people should know that. And again, it's more uh, people like what you're doing, Vincent, uh, with this meeting, with other meetings, finding resources, finding people to talk to, what questions to ask. Because I know before there was peer support specialists, we were all outside the VA hospital asking each other, what do I go when I go in there and ask my question? What, what type of questions I ask? What should I, what should I ask for? Because no one told us what to ask for. And then if you didn't know what you was asking for, first of all, you gotta know what question, how to, how to present your question. Like when you walk into McDonald's, I see the menu, I can't get the menu out. Same thing yeah. with the VA. You gotta know what you're asking for. Order one, two, three, four, five. You need to know what order you order for a large, extra large, or whatever. And when you can't get that out, you pretty much stuck. You just go in there frustrated. You get shipped around different places, and people give you all different types of answers. But the bottom line is, you get no answer at all. Wow. So, Mr. George, I have a question. So, if I'm a veteran, what questions do I need to ask? Like, say, for instance, if I had a situation where, um, I need to help my benefits. Who do I go to? What question do I ask them? 
How would I go about doing it? There's benefit specialists, but also you, you that's where you, you get your third party organizations. Okay. You, like, I would you join the DAV, you mm-hmm. join the VFW, uh you join, you know, if you were wounded, there there's a there's a Purple Heart found a Purple Heart organization. Mm-hmm. And when you when you go to those meetings, they have VA specialists that people that they help you with your with your app. They tell you what to ask, where to go, which you know, which they explain what clinics do what, you know, where do you where do you find certain information? What do you tell your primary so that you can get a referral to the right place? Because a lot of it d- depends on the question you ask and how you and who you ask it to. Okay. Your primary, you know, a lot of things in the VA now it has to go through your primary. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter, you know. It, say you have a, you, say you you need a wheelchair or a walker. Third, second, fl- I mean, yeah, the third floor, they're right there. They can't help you unless your primary says you need help, and then they send a referral for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and that's true because I know um what you're saying that that brought back a lot of memories as the certain um obstacles I face now because I remember at one time it wasn't like that to where you know you'd be able to go to these different floors and people kind of help you and they send an email hey um such and such needs something and you know um to help you you get that help and you know now I know you have to go through your primary care and if most veterans don't know how to get to their primary care I know they do have stuff on like va.gov that where you can um message your um you can actually message your um, primary care or they have a list on um, va.gov when you go through, um, I forgot exactly the name if of you're the clinic, If you're, if you go into the VA, you're assigned to a clinic. Okay. That's your, that's where you start. You start with okay. the clinic. When you go see the, now in the clinic, there's a doctor and a nurse. I mean, there's a PA and a nurse. Sometimes it's just a nurse practitioner. Sometimes it's a PA. Okay. It, but you have to start with them. Sometimes you, if you only get the nurse, then you, then the nurse has to refer you over to them, and then they refer, then they can refer you to a different clinic. Okay. But it's sometimes the, you know, if you get the right person, if you get the right group of people, you're it, you can breeze through everything. Gotcha. But you get one wrong person, it becomes a stumbling block. Yeah, that's true. And my healthy vet is what the actual app is called or going my online. Healthy that's what my healthy yeah. vet, because I was just sitting there thinking as you were speaking, and my healthy vet, because I know have I reach you, out have now. You have you add, Have you upgraded to the new version? New version? What, what new version? There has, there's a new version of my healthy app where you have to where you have to get a ID me code. Okay, you know what? You're right. I did, but see, I was I was very proactive because I'm a technical I'm a technical person. So I went and I I did ID me some years ago because I know they had cool benefits to where um if you um loaded all your IDs and different things on there, any application or site that asks you for ID me, they allow you to um actually um be a um like basically they approve of your identification because you had ID me. So. So I got you on that one. Okay, guys, we look at also our time schedule right now. Uh, you guys at some point want to close out within like five minutes or so? You tell me. I mean, that's that's fine. I mean, that's fine. Because, I mean, again, um, what I explained, you know, everything is good for us to talk. But, I mean, we talked about a lot. So I don't want to, you know, overdo it. Because, again, we can't get everything in at one session. But I would say this was a good meeting and I... Greatly appreciated, Mr. Joyce. It was nice to meet you for the first time. Yeah. I look All forward right. to doing more things like this. And I mean, anytime I have some more issues, especially for combat vets. Got you. Yeah. I have a I have a, a special project that this I'm working with, uh, working on to get so, gather information. So tell me a little. I mean, if you can tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I love it. Well, it it's on moral injury. Moral injury. Moral injury is when you have to do something that is so against your nature that that act alone, just the act alone, 
creates a problem in your brain. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. And it, so, and a lot of times, you know, for most, for most Americans, the first time you shoot somebody creates a, a huge moral injury. Whoa. And the first time you have to shoot a kid or a woman just puts you over the top. Wow, you, you have my wheels turning now because you made me think about, um, I probably deal with that and I might need to sit down and talk to somebody. The reason why I say that is because I know for me, um, just being out the military, knowing that that was my only thing I wanted to do in life, that's, that, that's been the hardest thing for me to do is move on with life after the military because for me, that's what I wanted to do. Like, I know I didn't like school, even though in the military, you go through school. Um, jobs, I mean, they're cool. But again, because I worked around veterans, I mean, military people so long, trying to transition and not work around non-military people, it's hard. Like, I, it's hard for me. So that's why, yes, yes. for me, I wanted to start what I'm doing, because it's just like, I don't know what else to do other than try to help veterans. It's very hard <laughs> The trend, if you are a, 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 your average military person, the transition from the military to civilian life is so traumatic that most people have a real hard time with it. Very hard time with it because you don't have, you, 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 you're accustomed to going, you're accustomed to, I have a job to do, I have a mission, let's go do it right now. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, what the heck did I do? I bumped something. And in the civilian world, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, we can, we can get it done. And we, yeah, if we, if we get around to it, we'll do it. Yeah. You know, doing my job, if I get, if, if I, if I have to, you know, if some, if the supervisor's walking around and I'm going to pretend I'm doing my job. Yeah. And I mean, I have so many examples of how things should have gone, but didn't that, it's, it's too many to, to talk about. You, you speak in volumes, because like I said, that's 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 where I'm at. That's that's exactly why I'm starting a business, because it's like I've been trying to find my place outside of the military. And most people are like, well, what did you like doing before the military? I'm be honest, other than playing sports, I really didn't have no goals, no dreams, no ambitions to be a lot. Because, again, I grew up in well, I grew up in the country. So my dreams weren't as big as the next person because I didn't see myself where I'm at now. And my life is pretty much good because I have a house, I have a wife, son. So I'm content with life. But outside of that, I didn't know what to do. I don't know what to do. The only thing I didn't know was I love talking to vets and I love helping them. So you know what? That's what the idea of, you know what? I don't know what to do. Let me do what comes natural. Talk. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Well, yes, talking to vets, that's a ministry. It really is. It's, it's a ministry. And being able to listen is, 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 is a great big part of that ministry. And being able to empathize and show empathy and then to be able to just give a, a, a few suggestions on where to move past where the people are. Yes, sir. I mean, yeah, I wish you, I wish MHA wasn't as like they are now because that would be a great spot because the training's available, mm -hmm. but MHA, they, they want too much from you now. Yeah. 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 And, and I, and I believe that's true. Cause like, again, like, um, when I started overcoming a lot of things and, um, transitioning from the fact where I needed help. Me and my psych my psych uh, my psychiatrist, we would talk a lot. And they're like, Miss Sindab, you need to do something to help veterans because you're very knowledgeable of just a lot of different stuff. And you you able to engage and talk about a lot of stuff because you're able to explain how you feel, talk about things you're doing to you know help yourself overcome that. You're very great at doing that. And at first I was looking to do it. But then again when I got to that check box list and I start seeing all these different requirements and different stuff that they want me to do. I'm like, you know what? I don't think I want to do that no more. And it pushed me away for a while to where I was stuck. Like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? Because I know I want to open the gym. I know I want to do this. I know I want to do that. But 
man, it's just so much stuff you got to go through just to do it. And two, after a while, instead of me actually starting a business, I just talked myself out of it. I'm like, you know what? I'll go back to work. Go back to work. And all of a sudden, all those issues I had start coming back up. And I'm like, man, what is going on? And it's the fact that it was something I was supposed to be doing. And instead of doing it, I tried to avoid it because of the long list of things that asked me to do. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just go back into the workforce because it's easier because, again, you know, they're not requiring me to do a lot. And I can somehow figure out how to, you know, maneuver around this system and just deal with, you know, the things that come with that. But, again, that stuff started becoming hard because every day I'm going to work, I got this boss who's doing this, and I'm looking like, man, what am I doing? What am I doing? Then I meet vets at work. And for hours, we just talk, 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 talk. So I'm not working. I'm sitting there trying to help vets. And I'm explaining to them, hey, you can go do this to get your benefits. And I'm just talking, talking, talking. They're like, why are you here? And I'm like, uh, uh, uh. And a lot of us was because, again, I, that fear came of the unknown partially for starting a business. But then the criteria and the things that, you know, the bears they put out there that makes it very difficult for you to start. Well, have, have you talked to the PTSD Foundation? No, sir. I don't even know who that is. Oh, me or oh mine. <laughs> I will send you because I have talked to one of one of their uh, one of their coordinators today, and that would be a very good place to start. Okay. And because they're looking for people, because they're coming, they want to, they want to join the, the Fort Bend County Vets Court and help counsel people, talk to them, and they can help you with training. Even if you don't do that, they can help you with get get in the loop to start getting training. Yeah, and that, and that'd be something beneficial because I know um where I'm at, which of course I'm in the Fort Worth area um. Fort Worth is not like Houston when it comes to different things because um, I remember when I was in Houston back in 2013, I think that was, Houston yeah. didn't have a lot of resources. But for me, when I went back to Charleston, South Carolina, where I'm from, I was able to get a lot of different help because it was much more smaller um, versus when I was in Houston. <laughs> man, I went through like eight or nine primary care doctors, through six different, four or five, six different clinics, like for a whole two years, I never seen one doctor because they couldn't figure out where I was supposed to be at. But then when I went to South Carolina, it's just like everything came into play um, to where I got all the help and the resources that I need. But again, um, you know, ministry wise, I needed to be somewhere to where I could have a church home. So that's what brought me back to Fort Worth. And since I've been back to Fort Worth, I haven't been as plugged into the system here because it just seemed like it's still a work in progress. And then, you know, COVID happened. So it just, it got to the point where I was like, man, I don't know the system. It's much more larger. Whereas in Charleston, I can just walk in a VA and I know people. I can maneuver around. I knew the system. But here, it, um, I would say now because of COVID, it made it so hard to where I just kind of like, okay, you know what? Let me back up for a minute and so I can figure out where I'm going at again before I start doing this. Because again, it becomes stressful. Okay. <laughs> That means okay. I'm gonna, I'll see. I'm gonna go. I'll go through my phone because yes, I've got something. Because I know you've never heard of the Veterans Freedom Retreat. Oh, sir. It's in the Fort Worth area. They bring veterans in for a week. They'll bring the veteran. That, like you could, you and your wife could go, and they'll pay. They pay transportation. They get room. Everything. I don't know what they've been doing since COVID, but it's a great. I mean, it was designed like a, a vet. You go in, you, you could bring your battle buddy or you could bring your spouse and then they help you to work through a lot of the issues. Okay. That's something um, that's, I, I, look, I look forward to learning more about that because I know where I'm at in the North Fort Worth area. Um, I, I have reached out to a different, um, to some groups. I think um, the veteran commerce and I think there's a VFW that I reached out to if I remember correctly. They're supposed to be building one here in my area, but there there isn't one out here yet. So it's just a lot of different stuff to where everything here is more so in Dallas. But if you know anything about DFW area, Dallas is a whole nother hour or something away. And I'm like, bro, that's, I'm not finna keep driving and going way out there just to get help. So again, like, I, I, 
between, between Conroe and Dallas, I mean, Conroe and Houston, it's 84 miles. And then if you start at Baytown to go to the other side of Katy, it's, it's like 75 now. Wow. So, I mean, just to get, you know, Houston is so big in this Metroplex area here that yeah. this is, if you leave, if you leave home at the wrong time of day, you're talking a whole day and you just barely <laughs> clear one side of Houston or the yeah. other. And that's and that's Dallas. That's that's Dallas. And that's why, like I said, for me, I haven't been as involved here with a lot of different stuff. But being that I'm starting what I'm starting, I realized that at some point I'm gonna have to get out there. I just like I said, for me, I had to start somewhere. And that's that's basically my message to a lot of vets is just you got to start somewhere. Don't just sit and wait around and do nothing the whole time. You, you have to start somewhere, because if you don't occupy that time and get your mind and juices flowing, you'll find yourself, man, shutting everything out and not making any progression at all. And I believe just some progression is better than no progression, so. Oh, yeah. I agree, I agree with that. Now, one thing we should also note is that this is new. This is a new technology thing that we're going through right now. So you know, a lot of times if you didn't have transportation or certain places to get places, you can do it through, your, through uh, what we're doing now. There's yeah. some type of app that you can go through and talk to people. I have a therapist I'll talk to. I have different types of therapists, a speech therapist, a therapist for my stress issues. I can do that through a meeting, a 45-minute meeting through, through this here. If you yeah. don't have this type of device, in fact, I believe they're giving out new devices now that you'll be able to see someone's picture on your device now. Okay. You find out what the, what the government is providing for you for free because this whole new thing with technology is definitely changed. Yeah. So a lot of places you think you need to get to, you can possibly do some here. But I definitely suggest as well, what I do as well, I go places. And then whatever, it's like you mentioned, uh, Vincent, earlier, you got to find your different resources in a sense, mm -hmm. you know, different, different modes of how you need to get what you need to get to. But don't give up because you say, well, I don't have transportation or I don't have this type, of, this type of different phone, or I can't, I can't, I can't. No, there's a lot of ways. Just, if you go through Google, Google can give you a good idea of what your, some of your resources are, and then yeah. attach your resources to Google. Yeah. yeah. Or a meeting like this. Well, look at our time frame, guys. This is United States Air Force. We do look at time. I'm not sure what the Army and the Navy does. <laughs> we See, there look you at go, our... Mr. George. See, there you go with that. <laughs> we look at our time. <laughs> well, the Navy, we're always prepared for these kind of meetings. We, we, we do them. We, we, we just get them done. <laughs> well, in my days, you know what? We made Army strong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so at the end of the day, hey, we just figured out, man. Yeah. At the end of the day, we have to drop the Marines off so they can fight. So we got to be on time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do the same thing with the Army. Trust me. <laughs> we dropped them off as well. <laughs> well, again, yeah, man, I appreciate y'all, gentlemen, man. As always, man, salutes, love. Y'all keep yeah. going. Don't stop. And, man, I look forward to us doing another session and talking about some more great things that folks need to know, man. Let's right. do this again soon if we can, guys. Well, you know that I'm having surgery uh, next week. I love what we're doing. Uh, George has a lot of resources. He's had a lot of training, trust me. He comes from, for over two years. George comes from another county to help me. Wow. So he's a great friend. I met him. In training uh, through MHA, he has a lot of resources, a lot of training. Keep doing this. This is awesome what we are doing because you opened up my my thoughts as to what's available for me as well. I did not know. I, mean, I really it's just it was it surprised me that what people didn't know and what I mean because I don't I don't consider what I do that special. I just yeah. I just do what I do. You know, sometimes it's, I don't even realize, you know, the impact it has on others because it's just it's just me. And so I like that because Vincent, you like that with being family. I have no family <laughs> other than the military, other than you and your wife, which is my niece. Man, you open up so many doors when we met, and we talking we talking about military things which you can't explain to other family members or friends. Yeah. They have no clue what you're talking about. Someone wants to keep this going. 
And you know what's so funny? A lot of what y'all are saying, that's us as veterans, man, because we, well, I mean, one of our models, I don't know if it was in the Navy or the Air Force, but it was selfless service, man. I mean, that just who we are. Because even with me, like I always tell people, oh, when they ask me, like, are you doing it for money? No, I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for the help that I need. Because again, and me getting the help I need, I'm able to help other veterans and we able to help each other. And we, you know, it helps us keep going because I mean, that's how I was in basic training, man. If you all about taking care of just yourself, you, you can survive basic training because basic training was filled with team building exercises. Like it was all about yeah. helping that person to your left, to your right. And that's what all of my um, endeavors and things I want to get into is always with that mindset that I can't do it by myself and I don't want to do it by myself. And, uh, and for me, you helped me start this business because, again, at one time, I was waiting for other vets to, 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 to um, jump on my idea. Like, I tell them about it, and I'm looking like, okay, they're going to help me. But I realized that in doing what I want to do, people aren't always going to jump aboard, but I need to just start and let people see what I'm doing. And eventually, people will catch on at some point and look at where we at. Now we're on a session where it's three of us talking. But at one time, it was none of us talking. I wasn't talking. I was just sitting around waiting, twiddling my thumb, like, man, at some point, yeah. somebody going to buy into my idea, and they're going to say, let's go. But I realized that that's not how life works now that I'm not in the military. I just got to go for what I can go for and just start and see where it leads to. Because, again, I'm not doing it for money money or none of that. So my motivation is helping somebody like me, and that's all I want to do. Even if that just listen or talk or explain my, you know, what I'm going through, I, I just want to help in that way because, again, it's helping me. <laughs> At the end of the day, so you know, I would like to go get ready to close out. But uh, Vincent and George, if we could at some point, let's talk about your relationships because a lot of veterans, we have a lot of issues with our personal relationships, our marriages, with our children. With